My name's Austin. I served in the U.S. Army for 10 years. I deployed to combat multiple times, a couple of places being Syria and Afghanistan. And I'd say I know about com combat, I know about war. And I gave my life to pursuing these groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And now I've pushed that behind and I've chosen my family my wife, my daughter, and what the future has in store for us within God. And, and truly the family life and in the home and what we face here and this walk with Christ is, is more of a war than I faced out there. Especially the more I've leaned into him. There's more spiritual warfare, but it's more rewarding and it's more true, even though it's unseen by the eye, the majority especially. It's so much more true than this enemy that they gave us in a packet in an Intel brief, and they said, these are your enemy, go hunt them now. I didn't know that guy. <laughs> but I see the enemy over here trying to get in the way of my marriage, trying to influence my children. So I stand for this side within Christ. Well, Real Life, it's so good to see you guys. I am so glad that you're here today, and welcome to the final installment of this series we've called How to Protect Your Family. And several Sundays, uh, we've had our guest, Austin, remind us, this seasoned warrior, this guy who for over 10 years fought in battlefields and conflicts and fights all around the world. He's been overseas defending our freedom in this country. You heard him say that of all the battles, of all the fights and all the battlefields that he's been on, the one that he's had here fighting for his family, for his child, uh, for the things of God has been the most important and the most fierce battle. And so I'm so thankful for him reminding us of that. It's why we spent so much time in this text. So turn to Ephesians chapter 6 uh, one last time in this series. And um, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. Gave out four Bibles uh, last Sunday out in the lobby here in Austin. Uh, but for, love for you to have a copy of God's Word. Also, take out your message notes if you would. There's a way to follow along. We've got them in the Corpus Home Churches and online. You can download these. Because I want to start today with a verse that's in your notes, and I'll put it on the screen for you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Corpus uh, Online, right here in the room. Let's say this together, real life. What does it say? We are not fighting against humans. We are not fighting against humans. Uh, Corpus Home Church Online, right here in the room. Turn to your neighbor and just say, you are not my enemy. Just tell them, you are not my enemy, all right? I know it sounded like we were enemies on the way here, but you are... You are not my enemy. Listen, if you can see them, they are not your enemy. Uh, we are all in, the, in a fight. So circle the word we in your notes. We are not fighting against humans. We're in this fight together. And that's why we all need this armor. Uh, we all need to put this armor on because uh, all of us together, everyone listening uh, can win this fight, but everyone listening to me is in a fight. I don't know what you're fighting for today, Maybe you're in a fight in your marriage. Maybe you're fighting for your kids. Maybe it's a fight for your teenagers. Maybe it's a fight for your grandkids. Maybe it's a fight just to stay positive. Uh, maybe it's a fight to, uh, to be generous. Uh, maybe it's a fight not to complain. Uh, maybe it's a, a fight in, in your financial situation. Uh, maybe it's a fight just to do the next right thing. Whatever your fight is, we're all in the fight together. And so maybe it's just a fight to stay grateful uh, for all of God's blessings, even when you can't see them. But the whole big idea of this series is, and has been, and will be today, we need to stop fighting against each other and start fighting for each other. That's why we're putting on this armor. Um, and that's why I had you circle the word we, because we win together. Uh, speaking of uh, being together, being on a team, this being God's family, I was able to meet three new families in Corpus 
last Sunday at the open house. It was awesome to meet uh, all of you guys. Um, and I just want to say a special shout out to uh, Jeremy and Leslie. Uh, they were watching us online on the island, uh, came to the open house, and are today uh, at a home church for the very first time. Uh, them and their five children. Uh, so I want to give up a big round of applause for Corpus. We love you. Awesome. A uh, big thank you to the Garys and to the Stegalls and the Stouts for opening your home, having home church. We're almost there in that temporary space and can't wait uh, to be together with you guys in a few weeks. But we is greater than me. We can make it through it together. We can win together. We have to stay connected. That's why the enemy's always trying to divide us, always trying to get us to be mad at each other, always trying to promote division and disharmony and disunity, because if we're divided, then we're losing the fight, but we have to win, and we are not fighting. If you can see them, they're not your enemy. There is a spiritual battle, and we have to fight together to push back darkness with the light and love of Jesus. So before I get into the text today, I just want to remind us a couple things about we, like we, we have to stay together. Uh, so best time for me to do two quick uh, in invitations. The first one is, is to the series next Sunday. So I'm going to start a series called This is Stressful, uh, and uh, it just is. I don't even have to have a show of hands, everybody. It's stressful. You're in stress. And so you get one of these cards, you uh, post it on Facebook, Instagram, you invite some friends to come. And don't do this, though. Don't go, you look stressful. Here, no. They're already stressed. Man, we're in an election cycle, the price of milk's up, and we've got holiday season and the in-laws are coming. Okay, we're stressed. And so don't ask them if they are stressed. Just say, hey, I'd love for you to come. And we kick off that series next week. That's gathering for all of us. We need to keep coming uh, together. Also, a special invitation to those who haven't come to Next Step yet. Uh, we've got a special one-time seminar. It's a couple hours long where we just spend time with you. And we've got one coming up uh, at each campus before the end of the year. So at Austin and online, it's next Sunday. So don't miss it. If you haven't officially connected with us, we want to hear your story, you to hear ours. And this is a fast-track way to connect. Uh, if you're in uh, Corpus, we're going to have a next step on that soft launch in December, so I'd love to meet you in person. Uh, but connection. We all need connection because we all need protection. So get to uh, next Sunday, but also uh, to next step, all right? So here's Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, look at verse 13. It says, therefore, and by the way, you can write this in because we don't see it in the English language, but we put on every piece of God's armor. This is a plural uh, this ex expression, a plural imploring of us to, we have to all do this. We have to put on every piece of God's armor. So you, circle that word you, that's also plural. Because we're Americans, we think that's us. We're just like, that's just me. No, it's you, all of you. In other words, you could literally say, so that all of you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. So we need to put this armor on together. We've gone through the armor that's listed there. So go down to verse 16, and we're going to do the last two pieces today. It says, in addition to all of these, watch this, hold up the shield of faith. So we'll talk about the shield of faith today. Why do we need the shield of faith? Because it stops the fiery arrows. So circle fiery arrows. We'll come back to that. They're not just arrows. They're on fire, okay? Uh, the fiery arrows of the devil. So verse 17 says, put on salvation as your helmet. We talked about the helmet last week today. We're going to talk about the sword. It says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, this language is meant to motivate you. This is like a locker room speech before you go out for the game. This, this text is meant to inspire you. Like, hey, there's a fight. Are you ready? Like, there, there, there's a war. Are you in? I mean, it's like there's an invisible enemy, and we're going to win, but we got to do this together. Let's put on some armor, and let's go, okay? It, it, it's like this, uh, you know, this imploring battlefield speech. It's like the opening of the movie Gladiator, which every man listening to me has seen at least 50 times. It's like, honey, haven't we seen that? Yes. But I love this part, and then I love this part, and I love this part, okay? At the beginning, there's a big, huge battle scene. The armies are lined up, and you see this clip here, and you've got the archers. This is how the war starts. The archers put their arrows into fire. It's like, hey, before anything hits the field, we're going to launch some arrows, and we're going to intimidate our enemy, and we're going to take out some of them. But we're going to let them know, like, hey, 
There's some arrows coming at you, and we need to. This text says, as Christians, there's arrows flying at us. Watch this. After they dip them in fire, they're going to launch them. And this text is telling us that there's arrows, invisible arrows coming, and you say, well, I, I can't see them. I mean, it's just nice, it's just a beautiful day. It's not a cloud in the sky. There's arrows. I mean, I've had a great day. What, what? There's arrows flying towards you all the time. And the enemy's firing at you, and he uses lots of arrows, but I'll show you his two favorite, and I want you to write them down because we all get hit by them. So here's the first one. We get hit by the fiery arrow of doubt. Watch out for the arrow of doubt because it hits all of us. And when you get hit by the fiery arrow of doubt, you start to doubt. You start to doubt three things. Does God really love me? Is his word really true? Does he really know what's best for me? And if you're not careful, what happens is you start thinking a phrase like this. You know, did God really say? And you start negotiating with yourself if God really loves you, if it's really true, and if it's really best for you. You know, did God really say? Did God really say you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage? Did God really say that you should forgive people instead of, you know, getting revenge and like getting even with them because they hurt you? You know, did, did God really say it's more blessed to give than receive? Because I don't really feel like being generous. I don't even feel like giving at all. Did God really say that I should be merciful? Did God really say I should love other people? Did God really say I should love my enemies? Do you hear how this is working? You start to ask the question, did God really say? Because you just got hit by the fiery arrow of doubt. And if you have been hit by this arrow, just check the box because we all have, okay? You got to watch out for this. Just think about this. The first temptation ever in the Bible that hit humankind was in the garden with Adam and Eve. And you need to study temptation. It's man's oldest problem. And Genesis 3 walks through this. And, and it says, Adam and Eve, now just think about this. Perfect environment, absolute paradise, just a couple, and they have no clothes on, and there's no kids. Hello, how can you mess that up? Here comes the enemy. And what does he tell them? Hey, have you seen that tree over there? I know what God said about all, but have you seen that? And all of a sudden, look at what he does. In your notes are on the screen. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, one day he asked the woman, four words, help me out, Corpus, online, right here in the room. What are the four words? Did God really say? Just circle that. Did God really say? The fiery arrow of doubt. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? What's he doing? He just hit him with an arrow. And my question to you today is, is, what is God getting you to doubt? No, I'm sorry, what is the enemy getting you to doubt? God doesn't want you to doubt, but you get hit by this fiery arrow, and you've been hit by this invisible arrow. But maybe it's, you know, does God really love me? Maybe it's, is God's word really true? Can I really trust his timing? Can I really trust his plan? Can I really trust God with my kids? Can I really trust God with my grandkids? Can I really trust God with my finances? Can I really trust God with my friends? Can I really trust God with my future? And all of a sudden you start to realize how many of us get hit by the fiery arrow of doubt, and just check that box again, because the arrows are coming, and when you get hit by them, you don't realize it, because just all of a sudden you're like, you know what, did God really say, can I really trust him? He even gets you to doubt, you know, can I really get involved in this church? I mean, I was hurt in a church once, so can I really serve here? Can this be my community? I mean, I know that the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, but can I really make this my family? You see how he works? The, the, the enemy will even get, he'll even get Christians to doubt if they're Christians. Am I really saved? Now, by the way, the devil will never tempt a lost person to think that they're lost. Because that'll get them to be thinking about it. He only gets children to think about it if they're not children. Am I really saved? Am I really going to heaven? And you, you may say, you know, well, how do I know? Well, listen. Do you believe Jesus died and was buried and rose again? Do you believe that there's a time in your life where you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? If you say yes to those two questions, you're a child of God. 
Doubt says, ah, it can't be that simple. The word says different. Look at this in your notes on the screen. John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, but to all who, help me out real life, believed him and, help me out with the next word, accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. You believe in Jesus? You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior? You're in. It's time for a battle, and you're on the winning team. But if he can get you to doubt, then that gets you to stop doing what he wants you to what God wants you to do. So you gotta watch out for the fiery arrows of doubt and hold up your belief in Jesus, not your belief in yourself, and it quenches that arrow. Here's another one, though. The fiery arrow of fear. Because my question is, is what are you afraid of? And if you've been hit, you know you need to check this box because you've already, you're afraid. What are you afraid of? You're afraid of an illness? You're afraid of who's gonna get elected? Are you afraid of a doctor's call? Are you afraid of a disease? Are you afraid of a breakup? Like, oh, I think they might leave me. Are you afraid of a, a friendship that maybe they're mad and maybe they won't talk to you? What are you afraid of? And have you noticed that we live in a culture that teaches you to be afraid? The world's just like, hey, are you awake? Good, here's everything to be afraid of. And if you're not afraid, just go watch the news. Have you noticed, no matter what you watch, what outlet you watch, it's always a crisis. It always says alert, you know? It's like alert, you know? Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift might break up. You need to worry. I know you didn't know, but now that you do, I know you're worried. And if you don't have anything to be afraid of, oh, the news will help you out. Because now that you know this is happening 800,000 miles away from you, then now you can worry. We'll fill you with fear. The, the, the enemy wants you to fear. You've just been hit, and it just happens. Be careful. Whatever has your attention has you, and the world wants you to focus on things to be afraid of them. But the only thing that can stop a runaway train of fear is faith. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Help me out real life. Say the first two words with me. What are the first two words? Stay alert. Somebody just woke up. <laughs> like I was asleep. Oh, stay alert. What are we doing? You're in a fight. You're in a battle. You gotta wake up. You gotta realize, stay alert. Watch, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. You know, uh, lions out in the wild, their roar is 114 decibels. That's the same decibels of a thunderclap. When thunder hits, what happens to you? Boom, you, you freeze. You're paralyzed. Out in the wild in Africa, when a lion roars, you can hear it five miles away. It doesn't matter if he's close. I heard a lion. And it's designed to do what it, for them to hunt. So when a lion roars, the prey paralyzes. You know why this is good for the lion? Because they could outrun the lion. But they're scared. The only way the enemy can defeat us as Christians is if we stop doing what God wants us to do and we get paralyzed because I'm telling you, if you're a follower of Jesus, this lion has no teeth. Now that's funny. He's roaring like he's going to hurt you, but if he does get to you as a believer, he can't get to you because our Savior and Lord has conquered death, sin, and the grave. So when he roars, he wants you to stop and be afraid and act like you're an orphan. Act like you don't have an army. Act like you don't have any armor. Act like you don't have a God who commands the army and he wants you to stop, but that's why you gotta stay alert. And by the way, what we just read in 1 Peter 5, 8, it's plural. We're doing this together. We have to be together in this. Now, we don't know about this, but Paul, when he wrote this and his culture, knew it very well. So let me go back to the Gladiator movie, all right? So here's the shields, and I want you to notice, and you really can't see all in this picture, but a shield, by, by the way, a Roman shield is the size of a door for a house. I mean, if you got it up, nothing's going to get to you, but it's also designed to connect to another shield. And this is very important because your faith is strong when it's connected to other people who have strong faith. 
You see, this is why friends are so important. When you connect to people who believe in God and are strong in their faith, their faith will hold up your faith. And all of a sudden, when the arrows come, you're protected because you're in a group. Is this a good time for me to talk about life groups? You need other people to connect because when your faith gets tired, they'll say, hey, it's okay. I will hold up your faith. We're going to do this together. Because when we're together and those arrows come and we're tempted to be afraid, watch what happens in this next picture. The arrows hit the shields. And my faith can actually protect your faith. Because that arrow was designed to hit you, but because we're together, it hit my faith and it absolutely has no power. The enemy wanted me to be afraid, but because I'm not afraid, now you're not afraid, now we are together in our faith. So I want a strong faith. How do I lift up the shield of faith? Very simple. Write this extra note takers. Pray. I mean, it's not on the screen, but just pray. That's how you do it. You just start to pray. This week, just pray. So what? That actually helped. Absolutely. Look at Psalm 34, verse 4. This is how you hold up the shield of faith. Say the first two words with me real life. What does it say? I prayed. There it is. Man, I'm going to pray. What does that do? I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. And what are the next three words? He freed me. Now watch this. Circle pray, circle freed. He frees me when I pray. Not, what, notice, he freed me not from all my circumstances, not from the battlefield, but from the fear of it. I've still got problems, but I'm not afraid because God has freed me from all my fears because prayer lifts up the shield of faith. And my faith encourages your faith And when you pray and I pray and we connect together, oh, it's unstoppable. It's unstoppable. You see, I want to encourage you to start praying this week and pray the truth over your life. And just say, you know what, I believe. I believe I'm a child of God. I believe that God is bigger and God is stronger than all the problems that I have. I believe that God is bigger and stronger than all the problems in the world. I believe that God holds the whole world in his hands. I believe that God is able to do more than I can ask or imagine. I believe that I'm gonna push back darkness with the light and love of Jesus. I believe that I will overcome evil with good. I believe I can trust God's timing. I believe I can trust God's plan. I believe I can trust his power at work in me and through me and around me. I believe that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I will not back up. I will not cower. I will not be scared of a toothless, roaring lion because my God is able and he will get me through it. He'll walk with me through it. And even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for he is with me and I will lift up my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and the maker of earth. Let's give him a round of applause, right? Now how's your faith doing? Me like, man, my faith was dragging when I came in here. Like, I got my shield behind me. Oh, man, here we go. All of a sudden, together, we realize that your faith helps my faith. And by the way, you say, Pastor, I don't know how I'm helping you. You showed up. We're all together. We're in this together. We're in the fight together. And we all have the same fight, but we all win when we have the same faith. And my faith lifts up, lifts up your faith, and we all together can quench the fiery arrows of fear. Now, you're so excited, but don't give yourself a high five yet. Because you can't, don't, don't hold, keep holding up the shield, because here's how ancient warfare worked. The arrows came in, you're like, yeah, okay. I wasn't hit by doubt. And fear. That was just to distract you. Oh, man, if that didn't get you, the enemy is now on you. Now you got hand-to-hand combat. Now you need a sword, and that's what, that's what everybody's been waiting for this whole series, because we're in Texas. Yeah, all right, man. I got a concealed weapon license. Yes, you do as a Christian. You better have your sword, <laughs> and you can't see it, but you better have it with you because it's going to be hand-to-hand combat now, and I want you to turn over to Matthew 4 because for this section, I want to show you where this is coming from. I'd encourage you to read this chapter, the the first uh, part of it for sure, the first section, talks about the temptation of Jesus. And this is really important because temptation is our oldest problem, and we got to know how to win against the enemy that's really good at it. 
Because if we're not hit by the doubt and the fear he's trying to get to us long with the long range, he's going to be right up on us with temptation and it's hand-to-hand combat, all right? But I want you to see when it happens, when the temptation happens for Jesus and for all of us. So I'm going to go back to Matthew 3, and in your Bibles or here on the screen in your notes here, look at uh, what happens right before Jesus' temptation. It describes this. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, what an example to us, at 30 years old, he got baptized. He said, I want, to fo- I want you to follow me in this. Watch this. The heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove selling on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me, help me out real life, brings me what? Great joy. So that, great joy. Now, if you're like, man, I'm having a great day. It's been a great week. I got great joy. Watch out. When you get on the mountaintop, that's when he wants you to fall. I mean, it's like, you know, have you ever noticed this? Like right after church, that's when he's going to get you. In the parking lot. Somebody pulled out on you. You lost the joy you just had. I have people who tell me all the time, you know, like, it's just like at the highlight of following Jesus, it just seems like everything comes against me. By the way, Jesus getting baptized is our example today. You ready for some great news? Uh, at the end of this service, during the last song, Three people are going public with their faith in Jesus Christ, getting baptized. Awesome. So excited for them. It's all about life change. That's what it's all about. It's what it's always been about, following the example of Jesus. But I have people who get baptized. They say, Pastor, I got baptized. It was amazing, and I had the worst week of my life. I'm not trying to discourage the people. Now we got one person getting baptized. No. What happened? I got married couples that say, Pastor, we finally got our finances together and we're going to tithe for the first time. It just seems like all the bills just came, came at us that week. What's going on? I had a teenager tell me, I'm just starting to read the Bible every day and it just seems like I just get sleepier. This happens or this. What's going on? The closer you get to God, the more the enemy will oppose you. The closer you get to God, Jesus, perfect Lamb of God, is going to get the major opposition here. Now, listen, I don't know what battle that you like to look at or game tape or films. You know, uh, maybe you saw a battle yesterday college, called college football. Man, it's battles, tension, you know. And congratulations to A&M. That was a pretty big deal, a pretty big battle, right? And so you've got this the game tape. Like, what happened? How did it win? How, how did that happen? Maybe you're into, you know, UFC and, you know, Holloway got defeated, and, and you kind of like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm in this fight stuff, great boxers winning, things like that. But I'm going to tell you, if you're into battles, if you're into fights, you want to study this one. Just mark Matthew 4, read through it, read through it, read through it again, because it's Jesus versus Satan. You talk about a battle? Satan can't be everywhere. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. Jesus is God, which means he is omnipresent. And he is omnipotent, but he has confined himself in human flesh, and he's here to save us. Now watch this. If Jesus gives in to temptation, then he cannot be the perfect sacrifice for our sin when we give in to temptation. You talk about a battle, this is epic. You're not going to get a better fight, a bigger battle that you want to study because temptation is man's biggest enemy, and it's always or it's our oldest problem. Okay? So what happens? Well, when does he come? After the pinnacle... And then look at this in your notes are on the screen, Matthew chapter 4. Notice it says, 40 days and 40 nights, it's talking about Jesus, he fasted and became very hungry. There's not a bigger understatement in the Bible. Man, he didn't eat for 40 days and he was hungry. Are you kidding me? You guys would get hungry if you waited four hours. You know what I'm saying? It's like we call breakfast, you know what I mean? It's like breakfast, like breaking the fast because you hadn't eaten in eight hours. 40 days, man, he's weak. And by the way, when do you get tempted? When you're tired and when you're hungry. Some of us call it hangry. Why? Because, man, I'm just, now watch this. Jesus, he's alone. That's when the enemy gets you. He can't influence you till he isolates you. And here he is, all by himself. And look at this. During that time, the devil came. What time does the devil come for you? You got to know how it works. And he said to him, If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. He's using a natural desire. Are you hungry? Of course he is. But use that natural desire in the wrong way at the wrong time for the wrong motive, and I got you. So this is is classic. This is temptation. I mean, Satan's throwing everything he's got. And look at verse 4. But Jesus told him, no, and read the next three words with me. What does he say? 
the scriptures say. And I want you to circle that because what Jesus is showing us, he's allowing his own temptation to be in the word so you know how to beat your temptation. The word, the sword of the spirit. Jesus, if anybody could have just said, hey man, back up, it was Jesus. But he shows us how to win. He takes out the sword of the word and he says, the scriptures say, watch this, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus shows us and says three very important things about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Just write this down. The Bible is more important than breakfast. I, I really want you to see what's happening here because he's like, hey, do you want food or do you want to do what God wants? I want the word. I don't need bread. I will live on the word. And man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, and that's how I'm going to live. So I want to encourage you this week, uh, before you eat breakfast, just try this, just this week, read the Bible before you eat breakfast. Now I'm going to just, it's another level of challenge here. This week, read the Bible before you check your phone. Read the Bible before you check any app on the phone, before you check the stock market, before you check social media, before you check a news app, before you check anything else, the weather app, whatever it might be, go to the Word. Now, uh, I'm going to actually show you a picture of my phone because I encourage you to do this. If you have a phone that has apps, I didn't even realize I've got five pages of apps on my phone, but I want you to move every app and only have the Bible on your first screen for a week. Because I didn't even realize how many things were coming against me or trying to get my attention. But I want to encourage you to have only the Bible on that screen. It's like, hey, I'm going to start with this. Now, somebody noticed in the first service, and it is true, I have 637 missed calls. <laughs> I got 74 texts I hadn't read. And I got 59 emails I haven't read. And there's some people that are like totally stressed right now. Pastor, you got to check. Oh. Okay. Now, let me just tell you, yes, I have missed some calls but I haven't missed God's call. I got people who want to get in touch with me, but I want to stay in touch with God. And so make sure that you are going to say to the enemy, oh, I'm going to feed my mind with this book, and this is the sword. And if you want to use the sword, you got to read the sword. And if you want to grow your faith, you got to have the sword of the Spirit. Now, Jesus is teaching us, watch this, memorize verses that defend your weakness. What we see here is in Matthew chapter four, I encourage you to read it, he says the scriptures say three times. And what he's doing is, is he's showing the enemy that he's memorized the word. And by the way, the three verses that Jesus quotes to Satan, they're all from Deuteronomy. Most of us haven't even read Deuteronomy. What is Jesus showing us? Well, Deuteronomy was the book of God's people that Moses gave, that God gave through Moses when they were in the wilderness and they were wandering around and wondering if they'd ever get to the promised land. Here's Jesus in his wilderness using the same verses to apply to his wilderness. He's showing us that find verses that apply to your wilderness, to your weakness. And he quotes from this book and he's got, listen, he can't go, he can't, listen, Jesus in the wilderness, he can't go, uh, hold on, Satan, I know there's a verse about bread in the Bible, hold on, let me see, I got to Google it. No. no, he's already eating the bread at that point. He's got to have it inside. And he's quoting the word. He's showing you that the Bible, don't miss this, the Bible becomes the sword of the spirit when the Bible gets in your soul. And all of a sudden, it becomes a weapon. Because if it's just sitting on your nightstand, it can't be in your heart. So, so, so we have to, to, to uh, fight this temptation with knowing our weaknesses. And so we're going to be tempted. Listen, some people are so intimidated by temptation. Don't be intimidated by temptation. I've, I've had Christians that say, Pastor, I've been a Christian for five years, and I still struggle with this. Friend, you're going to be struggling with it the rest of your life. Temptation is everybody's oldest problem. But don't be intimidated by it because Jesus is tempted three times in one time here and he's telling you, I was tempted. But he's not ashamed of it because temptation is not sin. Temptation is the potential to sin, but it's not sin. 
And we have to be careful when we have this thought. Some Christians walk around with false guilt. It's like, oh man, I just thought about this. Well, did you act on it? No. Well, then it's just temptation. You didn't give into it? No. That was just tempting. Martin Luther, great theologian, said it this way, I quote. He said, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. What is he saying? He's saying you can't keep your mind from having these random thoughts. So don't be intimidated by temptation. You get to, has this ever happened to you? You're feeling holy. You're feeling honorable to God. You're having a great day. You just helped somebody. And all of a sudden, you get this vile thought in your mind, like what in the world just happened? Don't raise your hands. Maybe it's only me. But, but listen, what happened is the devil put it there, and he's tempting you. And the question is not, do you ever have vile, unholy thoughts? The question is, do you have them over for dinner? Or do you get the word of God to answer the door when temptation knocks because it's always knocking? Here's the great comfort for me. Don't forget this. The closer you get to God, the more the enemy will throw at you. But we have a Savior who can relate. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. And it says, Jesus, circle this word, understands. So if you're tempted, Jesus understands that. He understands every weakness. He knows, all right? Every weakness of ours because... Now read this next part with me, because why? He was tempted in every way. Wow. Every way you're tempted, he was tempted. Temptation is not something to be intimidated by. Every way that we are, but, help me out with these next four words, but what? He did not sin. So circle temptation, circle sin. They're different. You're going to be tempted. Don't be intimidated by temptation. As a matter of fact, I believe we would have a lot less confession of sin if we had confession of temptation. In other words, hey, there's somebody at my office and I feel tempted. Welcome to the human race. Once you confess temptation, then you can conquer it because you can lock shields with other people who can help you in the hand-to-hand combat of temptation that comes to all of us. What's your temptation? What is the enemy trying to you know, come at you with? You see, here's Jesus, God in the flesh, and under, listen, some of you are still trying to comprehend this. Wait a minute. Jesus understands temptation, yes. He can relate to me being tempted, yes. In every way, yes. You say, hold on, what? Jesus was tempted to lust, yes. Jesus was tempted to be greedy, yes. Jesus was tempted in areas of sex and sexuality, yes. Jesus was tempted not to be generous, but to be selfish, yes. Jesus was tempted to be rude, yes. Jesus was tempted to get revenge on people because they were unfairly treated. Yes. Wait a minute. Jesus was tempted to be really grumpy and blame it on fatigue. Yes. Jesus was tempted to complain. Jesus was tempted to gossip. Jesus was tempted with everything you can imagine. And the weapon he uses is the word for the scriptures say. So the more I know of this book, because this is a weapon, the more I'm going to grow in my faith and be ready for the enemy. And so I, so I want to be ready for the enemy. Well, good. So take out this card. It's in your program. And, um, and, and I want you to see this, but I want to put Psalm 119, verse 11 on the screen because this is what it has to do with. You can download this online also. So real life, let's read this together. By the way, this is a great verse to memorize. So Psalm 119, verse 11. Say this with me, real life. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now watch this. The psalmist says, I have hidden your word on my nightstand. Not what he said. I have hidden your word on our coffee table. It's a really cool Bible, and people can see it in our living room. He didn't say, I've hidden your word. I think it's in the floorboard of my car, but I'm not sure. He says, I've hidden your word where? In my heart. So that I might not sin against God. If you want to win the hand-to-hand combat of temptation, you got to have the word. So, You say, well, I don't need to memorize any scripture. Well, the first one on here says, when you're tempted to think that you don't need to memorize scripture. (laughs) You got your verse. We just read it. Man, you want to win? Hide his word. You're tempted with anger? You got a verse. You're tempted with worry, gossip, you name it. Being selfish, uh, being stingy, it's on here, okay? Find, and by the way, if you're like me, you start reading, man, I got to memorize all these Start with one. This week, your assignment is to memorize a verse where you're weak. And don't be intimidated by temptation because it's coming against you. Get the word in your heart. Make sure that you're ready in your heart. 
Because when the enemy comes against me, I don't have a Bible with me. I may not have my Bible app with me. You may not see a weapon, but if you come up on me, I've got the word in my heart. I am not scared of the enemy. If he wants to tempt me, do what Jesus did. No, for the scriptures say. And I know what the scriptures say because I've gotten ready for this battle. Don't miss this. The Bible is just a book until you hide it in your heart and you ask the Spirit to bring it to mind and all of a sudden it is a sword of the Spirit. It can take out strongholds. When the enemy comes against you, all of a sudden the enemy is defeated because you have the sword of the Spirit in your heart. So that's why you got to write this down. The Holy Spirit will help you. So ask him to write this down. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you this week. He wants You see, Jesus is God in the flesh. He's absolutely alone. He goes through his temptation alone, so you'll never be alone in your temptation. Anytime you give in to temptation, you gave in to a lie right in front of Jesus. He's ready to help you. This time, this week, he's going to be ready to help you. And I call this an emergency prayer, and I want to teach it to you. You say, when I get tempted, what should I pray? I'll help you. Ready? Here it is. Help. That's it. It's a real simple one. Sometimes I pray a little bit longer and I'll go, help, Lord. And in all seriousness, guys, I call it my emergency prayer because when you feel that adrenaline running and you feel yourself going away from God's best, trying to get off the track, him trying to divert you or detour you, you don't have time for a long prayer. And I just want to encourage you this week, don't give in to that temptation. It's just temptation. Just don't let the birds nest in your hair. Just, just, I mean, just say, Lord, help me. I'm trying right now, and I don't want to give into this. I know you can help me. Give me the power and the strength because I know that you're stronger. You see, the spirit in you is stronger. Look at this verse, 1 John 4, 4. My dear children, watch this. You belong to God and have defeated them. You've already won. You're on the winning team losing at temptation. You don't need to. He says you've already defeated them because God's spirit is who is in you. Man, you have believed in Jesus, accepted him. He's in your heart. And watch this. Is greater than the devil. Wow. Man, I got lion roaring. It's okay. He that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. Jesus is greater than anything the enemy's going to throw at you. And that's why this week I just want to encourage you to pray the simple prayer and say, help, Lord. It's what happened to Peter because I know I'm talking to people with faith. Peter had faith. He's one of the 12 disciples, but one of the top three. And in a storm that was really making everyone afraid, here comes Jesus walking on the water. Remember this story? He, Peter literally cries out, Jesus, if that's you, let me come to you on the water. You talk about faith? I want to walk on water. I don't want you to calm the storm. I just want to be close to you. Wow. He gets out of the boat, and Peter does amazing for about 10 yards. He's walking on water. Why? Because his faith is in his Savior. His focus is on Jesus. Whatever has your attention has you. He, he's, he's, I just want to get close to Jesus. And this is what happens to all of us, and all of a sudden it says he starts looking at the waves. And I know in this room there's waves in everybody's life. Some of your waves are big, bigger than you. And they're, they're, they're threatening to knock you down, and you've been hit by the arrows of doubt and arrows of fear. And what happens to Peter? He gets his eyes off of Jesus, onto the waves, and he starts to sink. And everyone here, you've started to sink. I'm losing. I'm giving in. I don't know if I can make it. But he says a prayer. I call it the emergency prayer. Peter's the one that taught it to me. You know what he prayed? Help, Lord. <laughs> help. And you know what Jesus did? He did. And he'll help you. And Jesus came to him and he lifted him up back on the water. Didn't calm the storm. God is much more interested in calming your heart than your storm. He's like, you're still on a battlefield, Peter, but now I'm with you. And I'm going to help you. You know what Jesus asked him? Why did you doubt? And why are you afraid? He got hit by the arrows. And he's like, Peter, hold up the shield of faith. Have the word. And when you will feel like you're sinking, just say help. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 25. And it says, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 4.10. At the end of this great epic battle between Jesus and Satan. Get out of here, say. 
for the scripture's sake. Wow. He's already jabbed him three times. You know, boom, the scriptures say. Here, the scriptures say. He's still coming. And one last jab with the sword of the Spirit, the scriptures say. And I want you to write this in. He quotes Deuteronomy. You must worship the Lord your God. And write this in. Serve only him. So I want to encourage you to make that your decision. I'm going to serve God. He's going to be number one. He's going to be first. I'm going to read my Bible the first of the day, and I'm going to give God the first of my week, and I am, when I come against the enemy, I'm not going to be afraid because I have the Holy Spirit helping me. Let's pray about that together. With your head bowed and eyes closed, friend today, would you just say a simple prayer? Maybe you feel like you're sinking. Maybe you feel like everything's overwhelming, but would you just pray that prayer of Peter and just say, help, Lord, and he'll help you. Maybe you just need to receive Christ, accept him into your life, and just tell him, Jesus, I believe. I accept you as my Savior. I, I accept you as my Lord. You're in charge of my life now. Maybe today, whatever's come against you, the enemy's been using false guilt because you had the thought. And today, you would have realized that Jesus understands and was tempted in every way. And he did not sin. And that pays for our sin, but also gives us the power not to give in. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this army called real life. And Lord, as we go back to the battlefield this week, I pray that we would lift up our shield of faith that's not in ourselves or in our own strength or understanding, but it's in you. And I pray, Father, that we would arm ourselves with the word and that everyone listening to me would hide one verse in their heart so this week when the enemy does what he's always done and tries to plant that thought in their mind, they will say no because the scriptures say. But I thank you, Lord, for your love and grace, and I thank you that we're on the winning team. And I pray that you would allow us to leave this place with our faith encouraged and strong, and that this week we would be strong and courageous, and we would stand firm on this battlefield. And we would know, God, that we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from it. You've already won. And greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And may you fill every heart and every home with that hope and that faith because of the truth of your word. For we ask it in the name of our conqueror, our king, our resurrected Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Let's give God a hand for his love, his grace.